Hello, on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Silicon Valley alumni, welcome to our monthly speaker series, A Prof on a Pint. This series engages a UCSC faculty member in a discussion with you, the local, excuse me, the local community of the Silicon Valley, with the goal of making us all Closer? Okay, <laughs> sorry. With the goal of making us all Renaissance men and women. We touch on a wide variety of topics, as we'll see in the comparison between this one and the next one. Now, our hosts tonight are the Forager. Uh, yet another startup in the Silicon Valley. The Forager is going to become a launching pad for new concepts in food and dining. So we support them in that. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I forgot all to introduce myself. I'm David Hansen, uh, and together with my creepy who's with us, and you'll hear from later tonight, I'm uh, with a volunteer organizer of this event, and also an alumnus. In addition, Mike and I are also uh, participating in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. So uh, back to the forge, I forgot to mention, please uh, consider who, uh, buying some beer and, and uh, food from them, uh, as that is how they get back what is worth to them. So now we also have online this time, we're streaming for the first time. We're testing out uh, some new technology for this. Uh, and hopefully it'll work for all future talks as well. We'll post a link, it'll be archived. So if you forget to take notes, you'll be able to see it again later. You can pass it on to friends. Now during the Q&A, pass this around. Hold it better than I have. And uh, please use the mic so that those online can see it. We already have some remote viewers and Mike wants me to say, hello, mom. <laughs> okay, for those who are remote, please post your questions in the comments section for the video and uh, we'll make sure to bring those up. Tonight, we raise a pint with Susan Strom Distinguished Professor of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology at UCSC. Susan received her BA from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, her PhD from the University of Washington, Seattle, and she did her postdoctorate work at the University of Colorado, Boulder. She's been with us at UC Santa Cruz for 12 years. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> do you want to do a drawing? Oh. The drawing. So you're reminding me. Oh. Yeah. She reminds me of a very important matter. So the for early birds tonight, we're going to have two raffles, one at the beginning and one at the end. The first is from the forager, the host, and... It will be for a beer. For so a this beer. is to encourage early attendance next time. Mary Merritt, is that right? Do we have a Mary? Mark, I'm sorry. Mark, Mark. yes, we got a beer. <laughs> okay, go claim, your, uh, go claim your beer. All right, thank you all. Mike will be back later. Great. Is my mic on? It's on? Great, thank you. This is really exciting to be here. I've heard a lot about these talks and I went online and watched a few of them. It's great to be able to engage with the community. So I tried to organize this as with a bit of a primer at the beginning to get everyone on the same page. And then I'll head into a little bit of my research, but it will be sort of science light. Um, and the topic today is talking about germ cells. Those are the reproductive cells that, that generate um, 
offspring and perpetuate the species, really important. And we'll be talking about epigenetic memories that are being sent across generations from parents to offspring. Um, so here we're looking at uh, parents sending their memories to their offspring, the young me, the young my husband, and our children. And I'll be telling you about doing experiments in this worm and how we've learned a lot of great lessons. So our roadmap for today is I'd like to present a primer on what DNA is, how it's organized into chromosomes, what is a gene, how is gene expression regulated, and then we'll get into what is epigenetics anyhow, does it impact human health, why do we study epigenetics not in humans but in model organisms, and then I'll tell you some of the lessons that we've learned from the model organism that we studied. So what's a chromosome? Um, I've shown, I'm showing you here DNA wrapped around these balls and then coiled and looped and packaged into a nucleus in each one of our cells. A chromosome is a long stretch of double-strand DNA, so this would be part of a chromosome here. An average human chromosome is about 130 million base pairs. <laughs> These are my learning assistants from teaching genetics in winter at UC Santa Cruz. Hello, all. So here you see the base pairs, ATGCs, 130 million base pairs wrapped around these um, little beads. Uh, chromosomes contain genes in a string. Uh, an average human chromosome has about 1,000 genes. Chromosomes are tightly packaged. You're seeing here the first level of packaging is, is around these little beads, and then they get further coiled and packaged into this nucleus. And that's because in each cell, in each of your bodies, is about six feet of DNA in each cell. And that has to get packaged down into your tiny nucleus. So I brought my prop, basketball, to show, to sort of make a size comparison. If this was a nucleus, the DNA inside it would extend from here to Berkeley, okay? A lot of DNA has to get packaged into here. So the packaging has to both um, accomplish compaction, but it also has to be regulatable so that certain genes can be expressed and certain genes are not expressed. And we'll get to that in a few moments. And then I want to reiterate that all cells in your body have the same chromosomes and genes. So all cells have the same, but the cells are different depending on which genes they express. And finally, each parent passes a set of chromosomes to their offspring via an egg or a sperm, the germ cells. So what exactly is a gene? A gene is a short stretch of double-strand DNA. So this might be a gene. This much DNA wrapped around three beads. This might be another gene. Here's another gene packaged into this chromatin, this chromatin fiber. Uh, an average human gene is about 8,500 base pairs long. A gene is copied into messenger RNA that goes out into the cell and is often translated into protein. And that's the function that a gene performance performs. It's the gene product that does something for the cell. Genes occupy a position on a chromosome and they are the units of heredity. So the chromosomes carry genes uh, to daughter cells and through the eggs and the sperm, they carry genes to the offspring. Okay, I wanted to give you a sense of what your set of chromosomes looks like. This would be a set of chromosomes in one of your, what we call somatic cells. Those are non-reproductive cells, muscle, nerve, intestine, skin. And you would have two copies of chromosome one, two copies of chromosome two, two copies of chromosome three, et cetera. Um, these two have the same genes along their length. These have different genes. And that's how we get all of this diversity in our genome. Now, you inherited one of each chromosome from mom and one of each chromosome from dad, okay? So that's your endowment from your parents of genomic material. Um, this is showing you that germ cells, egg sperm, are what, are what transmit, they deliver chromosomes from mom and dad. So this is showing a human egg surrounded by lots of sperm, color-coded pink. They're not actually pink. One sperm gains entry, the others are blocked. So it would be the union of this huge egg 
because the mother provides a big stockpile of goodies to sustain the embryo during early development. And the father provides a sperm with its little genome to contribute to the egg and to make an embryo. So here, when we are making babies, we are uniting an egg with one of each chromosome and a sperm with one of each chromosome to generate a baby that has two of each chromosome, two of each chromosomes, with their genes along their length. So that's sort of the basic of the DNA, the basics of the DNA code that makes up our genome. And now I want to switch into talking about epigenetics, and we'll also talk about gene expression. So what is epigenetics? Do we, humans, use epigenetic regulation? Why and how do we study epigenetics in worms? And what lessons have we learned? So what is epigenetics? You've probably read it in the popular press and you've seen the term and you might have a sense what it might mean. Uh, one of the definitions I like is all the weird and wonderful things that cannot be explained by genetics, which is sort of a non-definition. So it doesn't tell you what epigenetics is, but it's playful and fun. I think of um, epigenetics, I'm contrasting it here to genetics. So genetics is regulation of gene expression, how you look, how you behave, your health, by the DNA code. In other words, the sequence of the DNA. Epigenetics is regulation of gene expression, how you look, how you behave, your health, by how the DNA is packaged and how it's deployed. So this is showing you, for instance, that packaging occurs by wrapping around beads. And then those beads further wrap into these coils and this bigger, higher order um, fiber. So does this sort of packaging influence human health? What's the evidence for that? One type of evidence that it influences humans comes from studies of twins. Identical twins have the same DNA, uh, DNA material. They have the same genetic makeup. And in fact, when identical twins, identical DNA, when they're young, they tend to look very similar, behave very similarly, but they may age very differently. They may experience disease differently. They may have very different life experiences. And the logic is that during their lives, the packaging of their genome may be changed. Their genome sequence probably is not changing but the packaging may change in response to exposure to the environment, to insults, to viruses. Um, Fraga from this paper has actually analyzed DNA packaging in young twins versus old twins. And DNA packaging in young twins looks very similar between twins. And DNA packaging in older twins has many more differences. So those are differences that arose as they aged and had different life experiences. So can epigenetic information be passed from parents to offspring? That's a burning question in the field, and I'm not going to give you a yes-no answer, although I'll tell you in worms we have good evidence for it. And now in humans, I'll show you some of the suggestive evidence. So the model would look like this. As children um, grow up, their life experiences and the, the environment they experience differ, and that may impact how they package the DNA that is put into the egg and put into the sperm. Those then unite to generate the embryo, the baby, and may influence health and longevity of the baby. That's the model for how epigenetic, um, how epigenetic effects could happen in humans. Is there evidence that this happens in humans? And there is. This is from a paper by Pimbri et al., Marcus Pimbri, and he studied a population in northern Sweden. This is over Calix in northern Sweden. He was studying a population of individuals back in the early 1900s. They had detailed records of food availability, and then they tracked the health and mortality risk of the children and the grandchildren of those individuals. And they saw something remarkable, and that was a link between boys' food supply and their grandson's mortality risk, and a link between girls' food supply and their granddaughter's mortality risk. 
really interesting. And by the way, this um, is discussed in a NOVA program on PBS from back in 2006 called A Ghost in Your Genes, I think is the name of it. And Marcus Pimbri is interviewed in that. So if you want to pursue that further, that's a great show. So this is really interesting. It's fascinating. But it's a correlation. It's a link. And we cannot analyze cause-effect. And we can't analyze mechanism. And so those of us who want to understand this carry out our experiments in model organisms. For example, the little worm, nematode C. elegans, that's what I study. The fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, that many of you might have studied when you were in college biology courses. Mice are a prime vertebrate model. So why would we do our studies in a model organism and not in humans? What do you think? You don't get to answer. Yeah. You can't control all the variables in humans like you can in a controlled environment in the lab. What else? Yes. Yes, passing the ethics board. <laughs> it's unethical to do experiments on humans that are very much permitted in worms and flies and mice. Yes. Short generation time. So from the time a, a human grows up to make babies, I mean, a baby grows up to make babies is 16, 18 years. In worms, it's two days. Woo! Um, I saw another hand. No? OK. I will show you the, the model organism I study. This is uh, the tiny nematode worm, Cenorhabditis elegans. Um, let me, I'll let it. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right here. Boop. Um, the worm looks larger than life up here, but it's one millimeter long, fits on the head of a pin. So we do all of our experiments using a dissecting microscope. Um, as you can see, the worm is transparent. We can see through it. So we can see all the tissues. This is the intestine, this granular tissue. These are the embryos. So it's already made offspring, and they're lined up in here getting ready to be laid out onto the auger and to start their own life. And there are a lot of features of the worms that we have taken advantage of. And I'll tell you some of them. So here's the nematode worm and how to pronounce it, Cenorhabditis elegans. Um, it's small, one millimeter long, so we can keep lots of them in the lab. It's simple. Only 959 somatic cells. That's muscle, nerve, skin, gut. So what's special about 959 is that, number one, it's a small number, and we know the exact number. 32 cells in the gut, 302 cells in the nervous system, 85 muscle cells. That's remarkable. Um, we know the lineage. So we know from the time an embryo is made, all the cell divisions and the cell fates of each cell in the embryo. And we can look at any cell in the adult, and we know where it came from during embryogenesis. And that's what's called the lineage. It's easy to culture. We grow worms on bacteria in the lab and in the wild. They live in rotting fruit. Um, fast development, as I said, two to five days uh, between the time a mother makes babies until those babies grow up and make more of their own. Excellent genetics. We can make mutants, analyze defects, no ethical problems. Uh, lots of offspring, so 300 offspring per worm. Okay, so we get lots of babies, and that helps us do genetics. And then importantly, there is conservation of genes and developmental pathways from humans to worms. In other words, what we learn in humans has counter, what we learn in worms has counterparts in humans. And so many people who study model organisms are hoping that there's relevance to human health. Okay, so the story I'm going to tell you is passing an epigenetic memory of germline from parent worms to offspring worms in C. elegans. And so just to give you a preview of what I mean, uh, and I'll explain gene expression in a moment, but the idea is that this purple tissue is the germline tissue in the adult. It's the tissue that make, makes eggs and sperm. This is a mom worm and this is a dad worm. He makes just sperm. 
Uh, the genes that are expressed in germ cells are genes that are appropriate for helping a germ cell develop as a germ cell. And what I'm going to show you is that those genes get marked in particular ways, epigenetically. And that marking gets passed through the egg from mother, through the sperm from dad, into the embryo, through cell divisions, to these two cells that are the two founding cells, the primordial germ cells of the next generation. And we think that memory is what tells those cells how to develop into a new functional big germline, okay? So I'm gonna show you some evidence for parts of that, although it's a long extended story that goes back to the 1990s when we first identified the genes that do this. So back to epigenetic information. And remember I said epigenetics is regulation of gene expression and how we look and behave and develop by how DNA is packaged and used. So um, genes across the genome have particular marks. And those marks correlate with whether the genes are on, they're being expressed, or they're off, they're kept silent. And those marks can even regulate whether the genes are on or off. So there are, there's this gene sort of with yellow marking, and that would be on marks. And the marks actually live on these little extensions. They're, for, for folks who know the molecular biology here, Histones make up these little beads, and these are the tails of the histones. And we're looking at marks that are on those tails. So yellow marks mean this gene is on. Blue marks means this gene is off. What I mean by that, if gene X with the yellow marks is on, it means gene X is transcribed into RNA, the RNA is translated into protein, and the function of gene X is carried out. All right, that's on that means the gene is expressed. If gene Y is off up here, it's packaged into this dense um, genomic material, and it's actually hard for that genomic material to even get transcribed into RNA, and so that gene is silent. The gene is there. Every gene is in every cell, but what distinguishes different cells is which genes they express. So in a muscle cell, these genes will be muscle genes myosin, actin, things that help you contract your muscles. Um, in a germ cell, these genes will be genes that allow germ cells to make eggs and sperm, things like that. So we are studying the, an on and an off mark. That is what we're studying. And, and those are the epigenetic memory that we're dissecting that's being passed from parent to offspring. Do the on and the off marks matter? So I've said there's differential marking and it correlates with whether a gene is expressed or not expressed. Do they matter? And the answer is yes. Here's the explanation. A normal mother can make the marks. She can put marks on the genome that she passes through her eggs into the embryo. And that allows her to make babies whose two primordial germ cells get the memory they're supposed to inherit, and then they generate a good functional germline here. If the mother can't make the mark, the mutant mother, we made the mutants genetically, if she can't make either the on or the off mark, she fails to send memory into her, her eggs. These two cells don't receive the memory, and as a consequence, those two cells die. Okay, end of the line. Those two cells die, the animal grows up to be an empty, sterile worm. And worms are one of the few organisms where you can see whether they're fertile or sterile. You look, in, you look inside, do they have embryos? They're fertile. If they don't have embryos, they're sterile. Most animals, you have to do matings to tell if they're fertile or sterile. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a few sort of take homes and then I'm gonna show you how we did one particular experiment. You're gonna see what the science was like. So the major advances from our lab in trying to dissect this were we identified through genetics the epigenetic on and off marks, two different sort of uh, mutually exclusive marks. They're sort of yin-yang because a gene either has the on mark or it has the off mark. 
And we identified the writers. Those are the enzymes, the proteins that make the marks. We tracked the passage of the on and the off marks from the parents to the offspring. And then we tracked the passage of the marks through divisions in the offspring to these two cells. Okay, so that's how we were sort of tracking this epigenetic information. And this is what I'm gonna tell you about, the how. How did we do this? All right? So how do we see the off marks? We're gonna focus on the off marks and I'll just tell you now, we have the same story for the on marks, but I'll tell you about the off marks. So the off marks are up here. They're in this package, densely packaged DNA. The on marks are down here. The way we see the off marks is to make antibodies to the off marks. These are little Y-shaped molecules. They're in the, your immune system. They're what allow you to recognize stuff as foreign or not foreign. And so we make antibodies to the off marks. And then we um, tag the antibodies with a green substance. So we're gonna have the lights go down. Here we go. So you're in a dark microscope room now, right? You have to be the scientist, black. And you wanna see those green marks. So you label them green. You have dark DNA and you tag all those Y-shaped antibodies with a green molecule. And then everywhere where there's green, you can see a distinctive region of the genome. This is how we do, I do a lot of this. It's called immunofluorescence microscopy, okay? So now we've used our green. It's actually green, by the way, from jellyfish. If you go down to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and you see the glowing green jellyfish, they're glowing green because they have green fluorescent protein, GFP, and that's what we put on things to make them glow green. So if we use those antibodies with green label, then the off-marked regions glow green. The on-marked regions don't. Got it? And then we have other off-marked regions inside the nucleus here. So a typical picture would look like this. So this is six chromosomes and six chromosomes. And I'm gonna show you how we generate embryos that have these combinations. But these are six chromosomes and the lights can come back up. I'm done with the green. I'll give away my glow stick to the best question after this. Um, these are six chromosomes that have red stained DNA. All of the DNA is stained red, but they lack the off marks, so they don't have green. These are six chromosomes that have DNA. They have the red DNA, and they also have the off marks that are stained green. So they look sort of yellow, which is the mixture of red and green. So six chromosomes have red stained DNA, and they have off marks, all right? So now you're set up for us to do an experiment. And here's the experiment. The question was, do sperm pass chromosomes that have the off mark, a memory of off, to embryos? And so we set it up so that the egg, well, we set it up so the sperm was able to put off marks on its chromosomes. And the egg came from a mutant mother that could not put off marks on her chromosomes. And if the sperm can transmit chromosomes with off marks into the embryo, one cell embryo, then we expect the sperm set of six chromosomes to glow green, and we expect the egg set of chromosomes not to glow green. And that is what we saw. And this is the picture I just showed you, right? So here is the egg set of six chromosomes, no green. The sperm set of six chromosomes, green. And this said, the sperm contributed to the embryo chromosomes that have off marks. Some memory from the germline that said those regions of the genome need to be off. Now, you're, you're, you might be looking at this and say, but the whole DNA looks green. And that's true. There are little bits of red and green and we can't distinguish them at this level of microscopy. But we have, have other techniques called CHIP for chromatin immunoprecipitation that allows us to look up close and personal at DNA. And we can see off marks, on marks, off marks, on marks. But at this level, we can't distinguish that um, variegation along the chromosomes. 
If we switch the experiment, so now the egg brings in green chromosomes here. So now the egg has been engineered so it can bring in green chromosomes. The sperm is mutant, the male, and cannot put on, put, cannot put the off marks on its chromosomes. And now we see the opposite pattern. The egg six chromosomes have the off marks. The sperm six chromosomes lack the off marks. So this is the first step of memory. You've got to get the memory from the parent through the egg and sperm to the one cell embryo. And then there's a challenge. How do you keep passing it as cells divide? Because as cells divide, they have to copy their DNA mill. And do you maintain marking when you're having to make two copies of a chromosome from a starting one copy? So as embryo cells divide, this is the big question, are the off marks passed to the daughter cells? If this is the starting point, which I've already shown you, the sperm chromosomes have the off marks, the egg chromosomes lack the off marks. So now what happens when that cell is getting ready to divide? Each set of chromosomes, each, each chromosome makes copies. So that green chromosome makes two. That green chromosome makes two. That black chromosome makes two. They all mingle in the middle of the embryo and then they divide. And both cells get one of each. So the prediction, if you maintain faithful marking, is that all the chromosomes that were derived from these will be this set in this united set of chromosomes. The prediction we made, and this is probably the most sort of challenging to grasp, the prediction we made was that if the epigenetic marks are being transmitted to the daughter chromosomes with fidelity, then each nucleus in this two-cell embryo would have half green marks from these, half black marks from those. And that's what we saw. So this is 12 chromosomes here. Half of them are just red with no green. Half of them are green. So in the world of epigenetics, um, this was a big deal. It said the off marks are passed into the embryo and they stay confined to the chromosomes that brought them in, to the daughters of the chromosomes that brought them in. And that is, that demonstrates memory that you're able to send a memory and you're, then you're able to passage it through cell divisions. And ultimately, that passaging will arrive at those primordial germ cells so that they inherit off marks and on marks and have been sort of have blueprints for which genes they should express. So the significance of this work, this was this was really well received. It's very exciting when in science you generate findings, go present it at a meeting, and the meeting just can't believe it because in epigenetics there's a lot of biochemistry done. And so this was an example of using genetics and microscopy. And it was beautiful because it was um, visual and really compelling evidence that important epigenetic information, in this case the off mark, can be transmitted from parents to offspring. And we showed that that information is passed via both the egg and the sperm and is passed through cell divisions. So then the big question becomes, does it matter? Do those off and on marks really matter? And so we did an experiment that just got published about a week ago where we removed the off marks just from the sperm. We genetically removed them. So the sperm fertilized the egg and they made an offspring. And we said, does it matter if the sperm do not have the off marks? And it really matters. And the consequence is the absence of that information in sperm, so we took away the off marks in the sperm, causes gene expression to be aberrant, abnormal, in the germ cells of the offspring and it actually causes the germ cells to reprogram toward neurons. That's totally weird. Uh, they lose their germ cell identity and they develop as sensory cells. 
And we don't understand why neurons, why not muscle, why not gut, you know, why neurons? But we think the reason is that when we take the off marks away from the sperm chromosomes, we think that now the chromosomes don't have the normal way of keeping certain genes off in the germ cells. They're not keeping off neuronal genes, and they're not keeping off maybe other genes as well, but neuronal might be the prime culprit. And if they can't keep those genes off, then in these germ cells, those neuronal genes get transcribed, and they overwhelm the system and send the germ cells toward a neuronal fate, which is really interesting, and we are, that's what we're pursuing now. We just published that, and we're trying to pursue how, why does that work? So the work does have implications for humans. The on and the off marks are used in diverse animals. So they're not restric restricted to worms. They're in humans, they're in mice, they're in fruit flies, they're in zebrafish. So are the enzymes, the proteins that make those marks. They're also widely conserved. And those riders that make the marks, when they're lost or overproduced, have really deleterious consequences in humans. Um, they lead to all kinds of developmental syndromes, and it's involved in various kinds of cancer. Um, so we, we hope that our findings in worms are having, that they will have translational relevance to studies in humans. The overcalyx, I mentioned that Northern Sweden study and other studies have shown that the nutrition of parents, whether the parents are smokers, whether they're exposed to toxins, um, and even grandparents can influence the incidence of heart disease, obesity, and diabetes, and the long-term mortality risk of their, of their descendants. So we're trying to tease that apart in worms and then feeding it to the, to the mammalian uh, investigators who, who study it in mice and hoping that it will have uh, implications for humans that can be pursued clinically. So I am going to thank my favorite teams, and then I'll take questions and just open this up for discussion. Thanks to the Strom Lab team. This is the gang at Sabing in Santa Cruz. Um, these are the current folks in the lab, and these are alums that have left the lab. And Lord Gatos is the graduate student who did those beautiful genetics and imaging experiments. Um, Thanks to the MCD biology team. This is my department. Uh, MCD biology, uh, the gang, me, my husband, um, the next generation coming along. And thanks to the home team. I showed the early home team. Uh, this is a more recent picture of the home team. Clearly, I'm a woman in science. I, I gave a talk to the women in science recently. I'm one of the whizzes. And I have a husband in science. And I have a daughter in science. She's a graduate student at a University of Washington in Seattle studying bioengineering. And guess what? I have a son in science. He's at Berkeley studying epigenetics in yeast in Jasper Ryan's lab. So that's really fun. He comes home every three weeks and goes surfing with dad and talks epigenetics with mom. And we make a big meal. And then you're wondering about this guy. So what would you name a dog that lived in a family of scientists? <laughs> we call him Lab. <laughs> OK, I'm happy to take questions and open this up for just general discussion. Yeah. Oh. I know. OK. You talked about passing memories through epigenetic processes and actually got that out without tripping over it. I'm guessing you don't really mean memory the way we colloquially think of memories Thank as you. something in the mind, but maybe as something more physiological, but I'd like you to put it in your words. Yes, so I am using memory as a record of what was happening in a previous generation. In this case, the germ cells of the parents there's a record of that that is being sent into the progeny, and I'm calling that memory. So it's a different, it's a different um, use of the term than is the more familiar memory in terms of our human experiences. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the mechanism of action that causes environmental influences to create these on-off triggers. That is the $50 million question. Um, how, do, how, does, how do environmental cues, how do toxins and stresses affect, say, on and off marks? And how would that impact offspring and descendants, grand offspring and offspring? So first of all, let me mention that there are three different types of epigenetic, epigenetic carriers that most labs study. The one my lab studies is modifications on those little tails of the beads. Those are histones. Those are the beads. And then the tails are modifications, um, methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation of the tails. In addition, DNA can be directly methylated. And that is a way that some epigenetic information is decoded, is encoded. And then small RNAs are uh, present in nuclei and help tell the genome which genes to express. So whenever we think about epigenetic information, question number one is which of those is being used? And question number two is how does that get rewritten um, after different environments are, are um, experienced? So what has to happen is the somatic body, you know, this whole body has to experience the environment. Somehow the germ cells have to be modified if that memory, I'm using it now in terms of recording, is to be sent into the next generation. So you have to have transfer of information from the body to the germ cells, to the offspring. And then once the offspring is created, that information has to influence the whole body. And so there are all these levels at which there has to be signaling, transfer of information from cell types. And I don't think we have an answer for how it happens. Um, we're trying to do some experiments to address that by exposing parent worms to acute stresses. We're using alcohol. Human relevant, we can treat the, the worm parent with alcohol and ask whether that changes gene expression in the germ cells of the parent. And then does that information get passed to the offspring, even that are not experiencing alcohol, so that they have a different response to alcohol? So that's a long-winded way of saying I don't have the quite, I don't quite have the answer, but lots of people are addressing this now. Um, for uh for male germ cells, which are uh, constantly reproduced and um, generated, uh, and versus female germ cells, which are produced at an early age and stored right, in that right. way, uh, would you say epigenetics has a stronger effect on the from the female um, germline versus the sperm? Well, I, I don't think we have information yet as to whether the epigenetic influence is stronger or weaker, male to female. A lot of labs focus on the male germline and focus on sperm because the mother provides a lot more than a genome and, and epigenetic information. She's providing the stockpile of proteins, enzymes, RNAs that need to nourish the early embryo. And sometimes it's hard to tease apart whether an influence of environment or stresses or toxins is on the stockpile or on the genomic information, whereas sperm are much more trimmed down. And so lots of folks um, focus on sperm because you can sort of expose the male to something acute and then ask whether that information is passed without having to deal with all the extra stuff that mom puts in her eggs. Whether one is more important than the other to be determined. Yeah. I was wondering if you could explain how um, like so human phenomenon, like things like innate phobias to things like snakes, like how does the experiments with these worms kind of give clue to how certain proclivities can become innate? How do certain phobias like, like snake? Like snake fear, because that's often innate. So like how does, like how does this worm experiment demonstrate how things like a proclivity for certain phobias yeah, it's like, how does it I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, certainly some of that I bet is genetic, but some of it may be conditioned. In other words, if a child is exposed to something um, terrifying, 
there might be epigenetic changes that lead to phobias that could last the whole lifetime. I'm just sort of saying what could be happening. I do not know. And I haven't studied that at all. I think that's a really interesting line of investigation. I have a two-part question. Yep. Um, the first part is when I think about family history and you think about medical history and they ask you about your family history, I've been thinking about it just purely from genetics, but it sounds yeah. like what you're saying is it's kind of a mix. It could be things that are truly genetic and things that could have been environmental that got yes. passed down over time. And I know that it's very early in this whole line of study, but I was wondering, since you gave the Swedish example, if you had a couple of you know, more specific examples that they illustrated to help us visualize that a little bit more. Well, I'll tell you a story that I only heard about recently. Um, Jill Escher is the head of the Autism Society, I think in the Bay Area or San Francisco. And um, she has had three children who are severely autistic, uh, two very severely and one still very severe. And when that happened, she and her husband had their genome sequenced to try to figure out if there was a genetic lesion underlying that and they could find nothing. Now, we don't know everything that causes autism, so you're looking for something that would be a smoking gun. But then she learned, and she's written about this, so I think it's fine for me to share it. She learned that her mother was exposed to certain hormonal antagonists during her pregnancy. So remember, that's Jill's mother. So that was the grandmother of the kids who were severely autistic. And she, in pursuing this, it's hard to, like I say, it's hard to establish cause and effect, but she's trying to bring together as much data as she can to investigate whether there is pretty good evidence that there is something epigenetic underlying at least some cases of autism. And um, a co a co investigator and I are leading the Epigenetics Gordon Conference this summer in July, which is where we're gathering together about 180 investigators from around the world to talk epigenetics. It's great, and Jill Escher is coming um, to sort of bring her autism story and to talk to some of the experts there about the possibility that there is an epigenetic at least contribution to autism. That's a more recent story that just that I thought was uh, remarkable. Um, over here. Oh. Over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, this one seems kind of an odd question in light of the rest of them that have come up. But you did mention the research that's being done on uh, nutrition of parents and grandparents having an effect on the genetic expression in children uh, in humans. And I'm sure it happens in anim it's seen in animals as well. Yeah. But um, is the information that's generally been chalked up to instinct in animals, such as uh, salmon, knowing where they were born kind of thing, is that one of the things that is theorized to be connected to epigenetics or some other mechanism? I wish I knew. <laughs> that, I, I don't know. It, it seems really interesting that a, a salmon somehow um, develops, an, develops an imprint of where it was hatched, right? I mean, I saw it in sea turtles when I was out in Australia. All, all sorts of animals go back to where they were born to lay their, have their babies. Um, it smacks of epigenetics, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, how many generations does it continue? Does it, does it diminish the epigenetic uh, signal through generations or does it stay forever? I mean, what point does it switch off or, yeah, or peter so out? The epigenetic generational effect that has the longest effect is small RNAs. So you can use small RNAs to turn genes on and off. And those are easy to transmit across generations. And uh, that can last for many generations in worms. 17? How's that? Um, but small RNAs are really nice for, uh, you can, they're nice for being able to transmit a small little molecule that can get in between cells. Um, DNA methylation and histone modifications 
I think would be more challenging to transmit for many, many generations. Um, if this type of research can show that uh, certain transferences happen where it affects um, uh, mental or psychiatric conditions of a person, I wondered if maybe you could say what you think that might have, what kind of impact that might have on, say, criminal justice, or how do we, if someone is inherits some trait that might make them more sure. violent, let's say, well, I mean, we have, we have discussions often, I think both epigenetics and genetic influences on violence, um, anger. Those, I think, are sort of treated as diseases. And so the, the perpetrators get punished, and yet they're grappling, I think, with a disease that feels very much out of their control. So I think it needs to be taken into consideration. There are certainly programs that are trying to help the individuals get a handle on that, but that's, that's really complicated. Sorry if I'm not, these are great questions, by the way. They're really deep probing thoughts that I don't have all the epigenetic answers to. Yeah. Hi. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, I was wondering, since at the beginning you said that there are some, uh, that it's conserved the biological pathways with C. elegans and humans, that there's some that are conserved. Uh, if maybe the way that epigenetic memory functions in C. elegans could be like deaf, if there was a way to prove that it definitely was the same in humans, if that makes sense, like if you have any idea. Oops. Well, there you go, you can catch my lid, thank you. <laughs> um, the, the precise story that we've developed, that there is a memory of germline. So that germline gene expression is marked on the chromosomes and passed into the embryo and passed to the next generation of germ cells does not happen in humans and does not happen in mice. I can say that because in humans and mice, the germ lineage is not continuous. In other words, you make an, a human embryo, a mouse embryo, and we don't know who the germ cells are. So there is no memory that gets sent to specific cells that say you're the germline. Instead, at a certain stage in embryo and mouse development called the epiblast stage, certain cells in a certain region get signaled to become the germline. So they're newly formed. It's a new germline. And that means the idea of germline memory doesn't happen in humans and mice. So we're studying memory as a model of memory. But memory of germ cells? I think is not the type of memory that is, is being passed in humans and mice. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about kind of reconciling some, an issue in my mind that you, you talked about the on and off markers control like the cell function, like a muscle versus a neuron versus some other cell function. Yeah. But in your study, you showed that there's kind of a random shuffling of these on and off markers as they go into the other cells. So it seems like there's some like uh, paradox here that things are being shuffled randomly, but then there's these cell functions that are arising naturally. I would say the marks are not being shuffled. I would say the marks are very deliberately put on the genes in response to whether the gene, and to help control whether the genes are expressed in germ cells, the, the tissue we study, or silent in germ cells. And then that marking is consistently maintained in those regions and is passed in those regions to the one cell embryo, and then through division is maintained in those regions. Does that make sense? Is, does that reconcile what seemed? There's not shuffling. No, there's not shuffling. I, and the idea would be, um, so if you have a, um, a segment of DNA here, and you have packaging of those beads that have, say, off marks. When that piece of DNA is being copied into two pieces of DNA behind it, so here's the machinery marching along, taking this one piece of DNA and spitting out two pieces of two chromosomes. It takes that, those beads apart and it holds them. 
and then it makes copies and then it passes them to the two daughter chromosomes. And that means it's in register. What was here, you know, gets taken apart and passed to here, if that makes sense. And, if, and that's what would happen with the off marks. Now in a whole different region of the genome, you've got on marks and the same thing happens. The on marks get taken apart, held, and passed to the daughter chromosomes. So there is, I would say, fidelity in where the marks are and in keeping them there. And that's the only way memory would work. So you're right. That was a paradox. Right. Yeah. Well, I have two questions. You're using the term off mark. Is that the same as an off codone? And then you mentioned that um, the DNA methylization and the histone modifications may not survive multiple generations. Have you seen evidence of that? So you said the off, are the off marks what? Off? The same as an off codone. Off podum? Codone. Codone. Like a stop codon? Yes, or stop codon. No. Sorry. Okay. So the off marks is just my way of simplifying what, let me go back to um, just a picture of, okay. Yeah, I can use this. So um, on these, these are the beads that I said get taken apart and then reassembled on the daughter chromosomes. And on these tails, there are modifications that are considered on marks and modifications that are considered off marks. Now, what that means, so an on mark is methylation of lysine 36 on the tail of histone H3. And that's why I don't call it that. I call it an on mark. And an off mark, and it wouldn't be on the same tail. If there's an on mark, it can't also have an off mark. So the off mark might be up here, and that is methylation of lysine 27 on the tail of histone H3. So it's this long, complicated, covalent modification, and I just refer to them as marks. But they are covalent modifications of amino acids and proteins. That's what they are. And your second question was, oh, survival of DNA methylation. If I've seen evidence. Yeah, in, so first of all, DNA methylation, worms don't do. Most organisms do methylate DNA. In other words, they put, um, methyl marks actually right on the DNA, and that is a form of epigenetic marking. And the best understood methyl marks are in humans, it's um, genetically imprinted loci. And if you look up in Wikipedia imprinting, it's very interesting that differential methylation in the sperm versus the egg impacts whether the DNA, that gene is expressed or not in the embryo. It's a very developed system. Worms don't do DNA methylation for reasons I don't know. So we study histone modifications in small RNAs, and we just don't see our histone modification. I mean, the histone modifications are always being newly put on the DNA, but we don't see the original modifications persisting past one generation. That's what we see, in, or we don't see in worms. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, so my question is more about like epigenetics in humans. Um, so there is like current medical research being done about this phenomenon called weathering, wherein like certain people due to like environmental factors and stress experience aging more rapidly than others. And um, in particular, a lot of research has been done around like the phenomenon and how it affects black women. Right. And I'm just wondering, like, with your research in epigenetics, do you think that in the future there will be like more emphasis or like more focus on that as like a kind of subfield of the epigenetics? And do you think like your current work now will like be used in studies of that? I don't know if our current work will be used in that specifically, and certainly trying to get a handle on 
potential epigenetic phenomena in humans is an important goal, but it's um, impeded some by ethical issues. Um, one area in which there's a lot of epigenetic research is in cancer, because cancer patients want some treatment or cure. And so a lot of clinical trials are fiddling with epigenetic inhibitors and asking whether those can have effects and, and things can go to, to into um, human trials more quickly if they're to combat a disease like cancer. And there are certainly some epigenetic inhibitors that have pretty profound effects in the cancer realm. Now, I don't know about this phenomenon of weathering. Is that what you called it? Sounds interesting. I haven't heard of it. Um, the only situation I'm aware of that leads to more rapid aging is progeria. And, you know, that's the nuclear lamina. It's the, you know, defects around here, the perimeter of the DNA, and maybe how DNA interacts with that. But I don't know the underpinnings of, of this particular phenomenon. Sounds interesting. I'll read up on it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, Maybe if you could talk a little bit about how epigenetics, what the thinking is now with epigenetics versus just evolution, you know, kind of like the traditional mutation, you know, gets adapted, blah, blah, blah. Because it sounds somewhat like a shortcut yeah. for the evolutionary process. So maybe just talk a little bit about what the yeah. thinking in the field is. So um, one of the attractions of epigenetic modifications is they're reversible whereas actual mutations in DNA don't just reverse. They can be selected against. So evolution, I think, often involves changes in DNA sequence, and if those confer an advantage and allow for production of more offspring, then those can be fixed in the population. Or if they're neutral, they just hang out in the population. If they're deleterious, they tend to diminish in the population. Epigenetic changes that give organisms a, an advantage may persist, but they may not have a lasting effect and therefore impact evolution as much. Um, I think the marriage of genetics, epigenetics, and evolution is being looked at more carefully now, but I, I still think there's a huge impact of genetics on evolution, and the impact of epigenetics is um, ha well, is probably intertwined with the genetic impact. Do you have more thoughts on that? You sound like you might have. Yeah, yeah, do, do you? You're the off mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Professor, I wonder if we could talk you into the spotlight again. Maybe. Oh, yes. Oh, especially online. They'd love to see you. <clears throat> Um, so, Professor, I have two questions for you. Um, so Stefan. one, yes. So one is, um, <clears throat> uh, how do you think somatic cells transfer this epigenetic data to germ cells? Um, and do you think it could be from through the nervous system or endocrine system? And then the second que question is, uh, do you, uh, with these, you said you're studying the epigenetic factors in alcoholic worms. Um, what is the lifespan of these factors when you take the worms off? Uh, this alcohol diet? Yeah, so that, I'll go to your second question first. We don't know the, the, how long an alcohol effect lasts. We're just in the early stages of that in terms of what we wanted to do was um, expose the parent to alcohol throughout its entire development so that we didn't have to deal with some germ cells saw alcohol and some, some germ cells didn't. So we haven't, we haven't experimented with the timing and the persistence of the alcohol effect. And then your other question was, how do somatic cells transmit epigenetic information to the germ cells? I think it is the nerve cells that are particularly important. And this is from a paper that Bob Horvitz published in C. elegans that said, this was about um, salt, osmolarity, and hyper, um, hyper salt conditions. And exposing a parent to high salt can make the offspring more resistant to medium salt. And they think that the nerves are the somatic cells that sense it. 
that they send a signal to the germ cells. The germ cells transmit it to the offspring. And then in the offspring, the, other som the, som the signal goes out to the other somatic cells. Um, I don't remember if he identified the signal from the nerve cells to the germ cells. But that would be a worthwhile goal for sure. Yeah. Um, so CRISPR is getting a pre like pretty popular. And I was just wondering if it can be used to change epigenetics in the way that it changes like the human genome around. So CRISPR, have you all heard of CRISPR? CRISPR-Cas9? Um, it's the, it's, oh you, it's a method to edit the genome. And it was developed by Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley and also by a lab on the East Coast. And it's incredibly powerful. And there many um, researchers have been trying to edit genomes in various ways for many years. And when CRISPR came onto the scene, it's like we had arrived. This is the way you should do it. So lots of labs are doing CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. It's mainly DNA sequence changes. So you're either, I mean, you're going in with the whole CRISPR system to find a particular region of the genome, make a cut, and then how that is repaired is variable. If you leave it to be repaired on its own, often that what was cut joins together but makes mistakes. And so you get either inserted extra base pairs or you get deleted base pairs and you have created a mutation. You can additionally cut the DNA and then engineer how it gets um, healed. Both of those are direct genetic changes to the DNA. Uh, if you wanted to use CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer epigenetics, what you could do is engineer landing pads into the DNA that would recruit epigenetic stuff. You could do that. Um, so there are ways to do it, but CRISPR-Cas9 itself is not changing the epigenetic marks, to my knowledge, although there are new developments every week in science and nature, so, yeah. Hi. Hi um, I guess my question is about the plasticity of epigenetic changes, so not like which one is experiences more epigenetic changes, which one is more susceptible to epigenetic changes, the egg or the sperm? And the next question I had to kind of assess that, because you mentioned the limitations of the egg in that it has all those stockpile of goodies, have there been experiments where you isolate the nucleus of the egg transfer it over to the sperm to do these studies to see whether the egg chromosomes itself are susceptible to those changes. Do you want to come to my lab and do that? Oh my God. <laughs> transfer the egg nucleus to the sperm. Woo! Um, I don't know wh whether the egg chromosomes or the sperm chromosomes are more susceptible. I don't know that. And I, the idea of transferring an egg nucleus to a sperm, I think, most investigators wouldn't take on, in part because sperm are so tiny and their genome is so compacted. I mean, they just take their genome and they and then put it in the sperm head and deliver that to the embryo. Whereas the egg is a big cell and the sperm is quite, I mean, its um, nucleus is quite large. So a lot of transfers go into eggs. It's the other way. And you can inject sperm nuclei into the egg and you can inject somatic nuclei into the egg. Um, and that would be interesting to do, to look for epigenetic changes and then put them in a new cell environment and see how they, what kind of effect they have or how they persist. That would be neat. Okay, I think we'll take two more questions. Okay. And then uh, the professor will be available over here. And yep. I would encourage networking also for yes. a minute. <clears throat> okay, hello. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering if, if there's any epigenetic things <laughs> happening in prokaryotic cells, like with asexual reproduction, is there any thing happening there or is it just with egg and sperm cells? So in bacteria yeah. and prokaryotes, are, are there epigenetic influences? Oh, this is embarrassing, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, they, they have a different genome. They don't package their DNA with histones. Uh, they form a nucleoid. Maybe the DNA can be directly methylated, and maybe it can be responsive to the environment. Um, sorry, I don't know. It's a, really, it's a really interesting question, how broadly and 
you know, life does this happen? Do you? Huh? Yeah, okay. Over here. Yes. Um, uh, there's been a lot of news, obviously, about uh, sequencing DNA. Is this, are these on-off markers the same in humans, and can you sequence them and add that information to the information we know about someone's DNA, or is it, is it, is it a type of information that we can read and add to the body of knowledge about individuals? We can gather the information about individuals' epigenetic marking. So DNA sequencing sequences DNA sequence. Um, epigenetic marking can be assessed using an antibody-based approach where you're saying, okay, where along a DNA sequence are the on marks? Where are the off marks? And that used to be a population analysis. You had to have lots and lots of cells. But new developments are making it possible to do that in single cells. So in a single cell, you can look at where are the on marks in a stretch of DNA, and then where do they convert to off marks in a stretch of DNA. And so overlaying that with the DNA sequence is really powerful. And you can get DNA methylation information. And so it is all happening. But DNA sequencing itself is DNA sequencing. I think you can see methylated Cs. I think when DNA is methylated, you can see that in DNA sequencing. OK, so. Well, I think last question. Well, thank you, Professor Strom. Thanks for You're being welcome. here. And thanks, all of you, for your wonderful questions. It was a really amazing discussion. Yeah, really impressive. Thank you. So we, we have a little token of, of our appreciation. I left it over there. I didn't want to okay. carry it. But uh, remind me, would you be willing to help us with our raffle? Yes. OK. We have, we have three packs of banana slug playing cards. It must be present to win. Banana slugs. OK, we have Chloe. Do we have a Chloe? Chloe Bronick? Bosch? Ba hmm? It's the last name that starts with B-H. Three, two, one. No? No. OK. Nobody here? Maybe she was an early departer. We have Mia Whitfield. Yay! Mia. And a questioner. Crown College, right? Crown College, UCSC, 1991. Congratulations. And uh, we have two more. We have Jim Whitfield. <laughs> OK. Reject. OK. That Valerie Whitfield. I didn't. Hmm? That, she was the. She asked me. Valerie Whitfield, the third oh. in the Whitfield family. Oh wow! And they didn't. They, they left early. The whole Whitfield okay. clan. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of mixing. <laughs> okay. Um, Manuela B. Yes. Congratulations. And one more? One more. Because the Whitfield family has their deck of cards. <laughs> Betty Faultwood? Right here. Betty. Right. <laughs> hey, thank you. So you can leave that here. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. We You're really welcome. It was a real pleasure. You're welcome. Now let me repeat that we, uh, we decided to tape and live stream the show tonight. Uh, this was a bit of an experiment. We hope it worked well, but we're gonna be posting the uh, link to the video on our Meetup page and Facebook and Twitter. If you're not on any of those channels, you can come find me. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is UCSC Prof and Pint. Uh, and you can subscribe to our channel. Hopefully, if this worked well, we'll be doing uh, the rest of this series. Uh, hey, Valerie, you get this. And uh, I think we said my, my mother and my dad said that they were going to be watching, so I just want to say hi to mom and dad. 
And um, the, the like button is on the lower left-hand corner. And uh, tell Jesse, that's our dog, to get off the couch. <laughs> so uh, just a few announcements. Uh, hopefully, can you stick around for a few yeah. minutes to yeah. ask questions? We like to mob the speaker when we're done. Uh, to the banana slugs in the room, I hope that you will consider volunteering for the university. We have several ways. You can go to our alumni.ucsc.edu webpage and find opportunities, uh, whether it is through events or career development for students and alumni, through academic departments, or whichever area is most meaningful, meaningful to you. We really do need your help. The annual Alumni Weekend is coming up for alumni uh, April 26th through 28th and it offers an exciting lineup of events, including a special two and a half day excursion throughout Santa Cruz and Monterey counties, April 24th through 26th. You'll get the chance to learn how UC Santa Cruz faculty and students are combating climate change and it, its effects on our marine life. It features a keynote presentation from Professor Gary Griggs, who you might remember from our January talk. Uh, if you'd like more information, see Sam at the front desk. We hope you'll sign up and come. So please join us for our May event, always the second Monday of the month. On May 13th, the talk will be on Sanctuary, the role of faith-based organizations in providing humanitarian aid by Catherine Mitchell, Dean of the Social Sciences at UCSC. Uh, now, uh, take some time to do a little bit of networking, uh, meet the people sitting next to you, get to know somebody you haven't known before, and uh, or come up and say hi to myself or, or David or Sam, the rest of the team. We'd love to meet you and hear what you thought. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next month.